women make up 26% of the UK homeless population. 12% of these are in London. Being unable to access clean sanitary products has consequences and implications. And today, I'm going to share these harsh realities. Now, let's get into the flow of things. Who here has an embarrassing period story? It doesn't have to be your own. <laughs> now, I, I was 15 at an award ceremony in my stage school, and I came on my period. I was wearing loose-fitted trousers and a white thong with no sanitary products. So I wrapped some tissue around my thong, and I walked out on stage. The tissue fell out of the bottom of my trouser leg <laughs> onto the floor. It was humiliating. I ran off stage, and I didn't even collect my award. Every woman has an embarrassing period story. That one moment where you're caught short and left feeling exposed. But it's, for us, it's a temporary situation. We can buy sanitary products, run home, shower and change. And we can do that as often as we bleed, regularly and periodically. But for homeless women, it's a dreaded monthly occurrence living from one day to the next and hoping today doesn't bring your period. And if it does, having to run into the nearest McDonald's or public toilet to stuff toilet tissue down days-old knickers to prevent them from becoming bloodstained and unwearable. From having to choose between eating and personal hygiene, knowing it isn't a choice, you have to eat. So turning to shoplifting and facing the embarrassment of getting caught stealing sanitary products. Regularly and periodically, it's a nightmare. And it isn't just embarrassment that these women have to face. Not having access to sanitary products also has health implications. Toxic shock syndrome is a rare but potentially fatal illness. It has many causes, but it's linked to prolonged use of tampons, which lead to bacterial toxins. And let's not forget that sanitary products are a luxury. In the UK, they have a 5% luxury tax attached to them, also known as the tampon tax. It's insane to think that these products are considered luxury. But ironically, for homeless women, they really are. They're rare, so when acquired, they need to make them last. So they opt not to remove them for extended periods of time. This, paired with poor hygiene and a lack of adequate washing facilities, means that the chances of contracting toxic shock syndrome dramatically increases. Toxic shock syndrome can lead to hospitalisation and intensive care. If left untreated, it could lead to multiple organ failure and amputations, and outcomes are often worse for those who don't remove the source of the infection. Treatment is usually a simple combined course of antibiotics, but without this, the illness can be fatal in just hours. It's a bloody disaster. Pardon the puns, but that's all periods seem to be. There's very little media coverage or reporting on toxic shock syndrome and lack of sanitary products, but plenty of features portraying women on their periods as giant caricatures, as angry and emotional murderous harpies, something to be mocked for comedic value, for cheap thrills and laughs. And more often than not, men are the perpetrators and are responsible for these inaccuracies and stereotypes. When a woman expresses an opinion, has an outburst, or raises her voice, being on her period is quickly blamed. For example, take the recent Grand Republican Party debate earlier on in the year when Donald Trump's comments about the debate moderator, Megyn Kelly, being on her period quickly went viral, leading to the hashtag, periods are not an insult. It should have been followed with, Donald Trump is. 
But all the media is doing is teaching us that periods are humiliating and something to be ashamed of, when in fact it's the shame and humiliation faced by ho homeless women going about these essentials every day that we should be focusing on. But when we are faced with ignorance and arrogance and false definitions, it can be difficult to break the taboo, start honest talk, and start to solve painful problems. But it was one conversation that did make a difference. A Vice article written by Mayor Oppenheim, entitled, For Homeless Women, Periods Aren't a Hassle, They're a Nightmare. Not only did Mayor delve into a world of periods as I had never read about them before, she also openly discussed the plight of the homeless women on her period. She discussed things like how poor nutrition and being underweight can lead to irregular periods, and how male-dominated shelters fail to address the needs of their female service users, expecting them to fit into a system that is ill-equipped to deal with them. And how suffering from premenstrual syndrome and premenstrual dysphoric disorder, a much more extreme version, is bad enough. But to cope with it in unfamiliar settings, without essentials such as painkillers, changes of clothing and painkillers, and when you're constantly being moved on from one place to the next, it's both damaging to your physical and your mental health. This is a conversation that made me frustrated. I wasn't frustrated at Maya. I've since thanked her personally for the article. I was frustrated at society's perception. This was no longer a problem limited to the third world, with poster campaigns implying that it's millions of miles away. It's right here on our doorsteps. And I was frustrated that in the Western world, where the tampon was painted over 80 years ago by Dr. L. House, and in 2016, when the average woman uses 16,800 tampons in her menstrual lifetime, there are still women who are forced to stuff toilet paper down their knickers to stop them bleeding all over themselves. And I was frustrated at the healthcare system, who give away free condoms on the NHS to prevent STIs, but won't give away free sanitary products to prevent fatal illnesses. And I was frustrated at the government, our government, who are supposed to protect us, who have attached a 5% luxury tax. And products that are considered essential and exempt from this tax include bingo, Jaffa cakes, crocodile meat, houseboat moorings, and even more unbelievably similar items in continence products. Absorb that fact. <laughs> but most of all, I was frustrated with myself. A Londoner, a female, a proclaimed feminist. Three factors that led me to feeling very disappointed with myself and which led to a lot of soul searching. I no longer felt that I could have any claim on what I described myself as. I felt helpless and alone. <coughs> One person can't change the world. It took me a while to channel this frustration. I knew that I had to and wanted to do something. I just didn't know how or what. I had no experience of working with the homeless, no contacts, no knowledge of government protocol and charity policy. And I was and still am running a business that demanded all of my attention. As well as the lack of knowledge and experience, I lacked confidence. Why would anyone listen to a young woman with a comfortable lifestyle, with no experience of living on the streets? Why should I, do I, deserve a voice? This lack of confidence led me to making excuses. Excuses that led me to take delay in taking action for a further three months. I always had something else to do. But the passion was there, the Vice article had ignited something, and I couldn't stop thinking about it. So eventually, I picked up the courage, and I picked up the phone. And I started to contact three major UK homeless charities. But the response wasn't positive. There was a lack of statistics, knowledge and infrastructure, paired with what I believe a lack of acknowledgement and understanding. When the female marketing director of one of these charities has never considered it, I didn't stand a chance. 
So I decided to change my target. I started to contact the UK sanitary product brands. But again, the response was negative and generic. They shifted responsibility and hid behind each other. It was like playing a corporate game of hide and seek, which unfortunately, I'm still playing. I was naive. I knew that sanitary products should be freely available to homeless women, and I thought everyone else would too. So after these false starts and setbacks, I realized what it was that I needed to do. Instead of lobbying government officials, cutting red tape and changing policy, which I realized can't be achieved by one person, I would start to help build infrastructures and raise awareness of this issue. Now that I had a solid foundation and objective, FlowAid was created. I'd already started collecting sanitary product donations from partnering and speaking at other events. They were being stored in my spare room. It felt like a real grassroots start from the bottom up campaign. And though I took great pride in this, it made me realize that distributing the donations directly to the UK homeless population is also not a single person job. But they had to go somewhere. So learning from my previous experiences, I decided to start small and local. I started to contact my local shelters who were really receptive and then in turn put me in touch with others. Flow Aid has started a chain reaction. And then singular donations turned into mass donations from other outside sources and volunteers. The next step is to create a distribution channel um, that, don't, that distributes the products not being used by the shelters through other organizations. This step is imperative in getting the donations directly to the women who need them. And it's these women who I've been able to spend quality and uncensored time with. A young woman, 27, from Nigeria, was made homeless in London by her brother-in-law just before last Christmas. When I went to visit her at the shelter she was staying at, I took her a bag of sanitary products. She hesitantly, then hastily accepted them. And then she began to cry. She told me that she had been so focused on trying to find food and shelter for the winter that she hadn't even considered where she was going to find sanitary products. I thought about the lack of responses from the charities and the brands. And it made me realize that this woman's response was the only one that mattered. As I've said before, one person can't change the world, but one idea can. As Maya delved into her article and discussed things, how the shelters failed to address the female service users, expecting them to fit into an equipped system, Floreda started to address and solve this problem. Women are often minorities in these projects, and they will struggle to ask for the things that they need. Having the donations available directly at the shelters with the workers distributing them directly to the women, it really makes them feel that their needs are being met. Through establishing infrastructures in already existing organizations, the flow aid donations have been distributed to the following. London only outreach teams, where they've gone straight to the women who need them on the streets. London no second night hubs for people who are taken in for 72 hours, their needs are assessed, and then they're taken into hostels. Five own women's only outreach projects, including what, the Centre for Victims Fleeing Domestic Abuse, and a tenancy sustainment team for people who have been moved out of hostels and who have, may have never had their own tenancy before, and who struggle to budget for things like sanitary products just like the women I have met. <coughs> Though this is a great starting point, it's important to continue to encourage larger charities to implement their own systems and solutions. The overall objective of FlowAid is to create centralized donation points throughout London and the UK. At the beginning of this talk, I told you 
that 26% of the UK homeless pop population are women. 12% of these are in London. I lied to you. I don't know how many homeless women there are. No one does. Local authorities have been accused of manipulating their homelessness figures by only counting people who are bedded down in sleeping bags. People who are sitting up or standing shockingly aren't accounted for. And the entire culture of homeless women is based on being hidden away due to their vulnerability, making them invisible. So how can we expect something to be freely available to those who effectively don't exist? But these women aren't invisible, and they do have bodies, and it is our responsibility to be their voices. And it's time to start the conversation. As women, as men, as society, why is it so difficult to talk about periods? It's about time that we change, the, break the taboo, change perceptions, and start to create honest talk. And we need to create an environment that's safe to do so, an environment that's supported by charity and brand and protected by our government. My voice has got us this far, your voices can create echoes and further opportunities. Continue to pressure the larger sanitary product brands. They have a global influence. And speak to your local shelters and make sure that they're aware of this issue. And remember, when you're enjoying your monthly gift, spare a thought for those who it is a monthly curse. Tampons aren't a luxury, period. <laughs>